Chris, if you want to come up, bring those chairs. I'm going to invite my friend Mark and Volmi to come up because I want to ask him a few questions about grief. Mark is a licensed mental health counselor, um, and we've worked together in the past doing God and mental health events in our community, uh, at our church, as outreach. Um, Markin just recently wrote a book called Trauma Stories, uh, Discovering Strength Through Vulnerabilities. Uh, you can actually get that on Amazon. He may have brought a few books for us today as well. So we have a couple of books if you're interested in that. He also currently sees patients here in South Florida uh, and specializes in M, uh, EMDR therapy. That red mic right there. Um, and he also serves as a fellow elder at Gospel Fellowship. You're very, very... Uh, yeah, very busy. And your kids are in, in uh, children's church, right? They are, they are, they are. And so I'm just excited for him to be here with us just for a brief moment, 10 minutes or so, um, to give you a preview of sort of these hope sessions uh, the coming up in June 5th and July 3rd. Um, and just want to highlight these events and introduce him to the body. Uh, and so I just want to start with a couple of questions, Markin. Sure. Um, I gave a definition of grief, but how, how would you define grief? Uh, you, your definition was on point, right? Well, thank God. So for I'm just doing. coming after this. Um, it's when we feel, uh, what we feel internally when we've experienced loss on some level. And, um, and grief is not always just the loss. The, uh, it's not just the death of a friend or a loved one. Uh, I know that's one of the questions later on. There are so many different variations and forms of grief as well so it's lost on any level oftentimes a lot of my clients are grieving and don't even realize it because mm. they they only associate grief with i've been to a funeral and it's so much more than that okay so could you define for us the difference between grief and mourning grief is what's going on internally inside of you after you've experienced loss on some level and mourning is really just uh you know the outward expression of that you know depending on your cultural background there may be some customs and ritual uh it may be um pretty much how you uh display your emotions or the lack thereof mm -hmm. that could be mourning you know in i i believe in the in the old testament you could hire mourners like if there was a if there was some type of funeral procession you can pay a group of people to fake cry for you right so that of course we don't do that today in 2024 but um mourning is really your expression of the pain of your loss that you're going through yeah and that's important us for to know because a lot of people are grieving but they not may not be mourning right and the outside they may be great but in the inside grief is eternal could you give us some examples absolutely of, grief of what grief is oh or, yes you know yes. what i mean like what that may look like or it's just some examples yes uh being that i'm a trauma therapist i'll start off with that uh grief is traumatic you know uh and not trying to go in a, in a doubt a deep dive into trauma but it's the adverse experience that we've been through but also Sometimes we grieve un unknowingly, unbeknownst to us, the good things we never got to experience, whether that be affection, nurture, connection from our caregivers. Grief could be, you know what, now uh, me and my spouse are empty nesters and the kids have left the house. It could be Mother's Day, which recently passed, and Father's Day is up up upon us to where uh, parents are grieving either a miscarriage or the loss of a child, or maybe it's reverse. Maybe I'm grieving that my parents have gone. Uh, my mother has passed or my father has passed and Mother's Day and Father's Day is just a reminder of their loss. It could be divorce. It could be moving, transitioning to a new town. It could be a job termination. Grief could be, uh, of course, the death of a loved one or a friend. It could be estrangement from extended family members or sometimes immediate family members. It could be the end of a friendship. So, uh, I've known countless amount of people who are infertile, right? So I've learned over the years as a therapist, I don't ask newlyweds, oh, what are you guys expecting? When, when are you guys planning to start a family? Just assuming everyone, you know, uh, could have kids. Uh, it could be the end of a dating relationship. It could be survivor's remorse. For those of us uh, who sometimes we wonder, God, why me? Why did I make it? Or why did my relationship make it and not, that, and not my friends or, or my loved ones? It could be watching your child transition from either VPK 
thank you. <laughs> VPK graduation to walking down the aisle and leaving the home. Grief can also be, um, of course, uh, being a widow or a widower, right? Uh, and uh, so much, so many more, but I usually tried, I think I did my best to touch on the ones that we often don't see as grief. But they, we look at it as just life situations, but in the process we're grieving. And if we don't know that we're grieving, how do we process that? That's usually the bigger question. And that's so important because again, when we talk about grief, we may just think a loss of a loved one, but the reality is, is all those situations tend to happen in life. And oftentimes people don't even know that they're grieving, uh, but there are some cues, uh, especially with you doing EMDR and stuff like that. Like, could you explain to us just how does grief show up in our bodies? Because grief is an internal thing, right? And so how does that show up in our bodies? Yes. And what I mean by showing up in our bodies, our bodies are always giving us cues. It's like our body speaks its own language. <laughs> so as a trauma therapist, I teach people how to quiet the noise in their lives, to pay attention to the cues. For example, if we're anxious and you pay attention internally, you'll notice, why, is, why am I experiencing heart palpitations? Or if I'm depressed, I have this sense of, depression is not sadness, it's I wanna sleep all day. I don't feel like eating. My, 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 my diet is off, my appetite, things of that nature. I've lost interest in things I used to enjoy. As far as grief goes, it can show up as raging anger or guilt. It could show up as feelings of euphoria or depression. It could show up as fatigue, lack of energy in the body. It could show up as irritability. Someone asks you a question, you're short with them, or your tone is like, they're like, Danny, what's wrong with you? I, I just asked a question. It could be grief. And Danny's like, why did I respond that way, right? Grief could be overworking or excessive sleeping. That's one of the ways we soothe ourselves when we don't want to deal with our pain. We like to remain busy because if I'm busy, I don't have to think about uh, what it is that I need to process. It could be headaches or stomach aches. And also, which I just mentioned, it can also be just a lack of energy, having really low energy. Yeah. I know that in our first session, we're going to talk about grief and healthy ways to deal with it. Uh, so we don't need to go in depth, but just give us a few ways that we can deal with grief in a healthy way. Yes, I think the, the first way is, I'm so biased in saying that, be open to speaking to a therapist to see what's going on internally, right? But also, I tell people, if you have someone close to you who's recently lost someone, don't assume you know how to serve them based off of how you would want to be served if you were grieving. Oftentimes, the grieving person, uh, they're in the middle of, they don't know what they want, but they do know what they want, right? So I always say, be courteous and say, hey, Danny, how can I serve you right now, brother? I know that you've recently experienced loss. And, you know, I, I assume you want a lot of us to just come and bombard your apartment or bombard your home. But I want to be respectful. How can I best serve you right now? Is there anything you need? Can I just sit here with you? So I would say start there. Ask the person what is the best way they would like to be served. Some people don't want a crowd. Other people are like, hey, bring the entire church. Line them up at my door, right? So you want to see what, what is your personality type like? What do you want? And then from there, uh, you mentioned in your sermon, you must have been in my notes, uh, where Danny said, um, God is good all the time. You know what? It was God's will. This is what the Lord would have wanted. All those things are true, but we don't need to say it right now after the loss. We, it, we, we got to work on our timing a little bit. Definitely, you do want to incorporate things of scripture, the word of God, prayer, but try to minimize any type of silver lining cliche statements. Uh, one of the best things to do is just to be there pr physically and emotionally. That we, The grieving person doesn't need a lot of words at the moment because they're not really thinking. Their nervous system is actually working on overdrive, trying to keep them safe and comforted the best way it knows how. So they're not really processing words at the moment. So if, if Danny was grieving, I'm there, I'm, I'm helping your family take out the trash, I'm cleaning. I'm just sitting with you for 30 minutes, not saying much. Uh, and every now and then, Danny may throw out a statement like, wow, uh, I remember uh, grandma around this time, she would garden or she would do this whoever that person is that he's lost and uh, I'm just there ready to receive whatever he has the capacity to give me at the moment uh, if 
If someone within the body, you know what, maybe someone take lead on it and let the grieving person know that you're going to start a meal train and say one day a week, someone's going to bring lunch or dinner um, one day or maybe several times a week. If the grieving person has kids, someone's going to say, hey, we'll take the kids for a couple hours just to give you some time to yourself to, to go out, to just enjoy whatever you can get creative with it. Uh, another thing I like to do is like grieving circles. Uh, if a family member recently lost someone, get them around in a circle at the home and just have everyone express themselves the best if they feel comfortable doing it and say, you know what, so, so-and-so would have enjoyed this, so-and-so used to say this. So in those grieving circles, there are a lot of tears, but there are also a lot of laughter. And when you're grieving, it's like you're on a roller coaster of emotions anyways. You, you feel uncomfortable because you're like, is it safe for me to be happy one minute and angry the next second and just in tears the next minute, you know, which is normal, right? And the, and the degree of the grief depends on the degree of how much you love the person you lost or, or, or the pet or whatever the case may be. Yeah. Um, so there are so many more examples. I don't want to go too in depth, uh, but it's, it's this weird space of knowing your personality type and see what you're open to allowing me as your brother in, in church family to do alongside you to serve you in this moment of grief. Yeah. yeah. What I'm hearing is it, it, one of the healthiest ways we can deal with grief is through community. Yes. Grieving circles, asking, being sensitive, how can I help? That second hope session is going to be how do we support those that go through grief? We'll get practical tips, those things. Um, even thinking about, you know, the five stages of grief, you'd mentioned those. What are those five yes. stages? Someone by the name of Kubler-Ross started that. The five stages of grief are denial, anger, bargaining. Bargaining could sound like more, that's more so for something called anticipatory grief. All right, Lord, if you just save my mom, I promise I'll be, I'll be a devout Christian. All right, Lord, if you do this, I promise I'm going to, you know, like we're trying to bargain with God. Um, and then depression. And the last stage is acceptance. Acceptance does not mean, when you get to acceptance, it doesn't mean when you think of your loss, you're no longer sad. But it's, it's to a place to where you can go on with life again. You don't feel stuck. Oftentimes, uh, you can be stuck for years if you're not really processing that grief. Um, and these stages aren't linear. Some people start off with depression. It's not always denial, right? So you could be all over the place and you could revisit these stages as well. But those tend to be the major state yeah. phases of grief that most people go through. Yeah. Well, we'll, we'll end with this last question because I think this is important for us sure. as we think and close our time. Mm -hmm. uh, I was going through my social media feed, a pastor that I follow and know. Um, Levi Lusco lost his daughter. Uh, and then this recently, this last year, he lost his dad. He said, trauma is an event. Healing is a process. Yes. It won't happen in a day, but with God, it will happen day by day. Let me say that again. He says, trauma is an event, but healing is a process. It won't happen in a day, but with God, it will happen day by day. My last question I have is, how long does healing take? Wow. I love that quote. Wow. Um, healing is not linear. It looks different for everyone because we all experience trauma differently and process it differently. I'll give a quick example. Uh, a gentleman who I wrote about in my book who was a former client of mine, we called him Manny in the book. Uh, he lost his wife after 35 years of marriage, and we worked through and processed the trauma. It took him about a good six to eight months to get to a place to where um, he reached the stage of acceptance. Some people could take years, but I think the length of time depends on what you're doing in, to, in the interim. Don't believe the notion that, that, you know what, enough time goes by, I'll be better. What happens over time is that we get really comfortable with finding very unhealthy ways to deal with our grief, to soothe those emotions, or to numb ourselves to not experience it at all. But if we're processing our grief in a healthy manner, I would say, on average, uh, within the first year, year and a half, you should notice a difference, right? But be gracious with yourself to not say, ah, Danny was here by year one. What's wrong with me? Everyone is different. Be gracious with yourself, right? And, but just make sure that there's movement with your emotions throughout your grief. If you're stuck at the same place, that could be a sign that you need some assistance. You're not really grieving. So 
One person could be six months to a year. Another person may need multiple years. But what I would look for as a therapist is, is there movement in your progress? Or are you at the same place you were at the initial stage of grief as you, as you are years later? Yeah. yeah, that's good. Well, thank you, Markin, for your perspective, thank wisdom, you, brother. insight. Again, we're going to go deeper in these hope sessions where we'll have Q&A like this, but not only just from me answering, um, asking questions, but hopefully from you all as well. Because I know it opens up a lot of um, a lot of emotion, and we want to go and bring this to God and see what the biblical pr perspective is. And so we want to just finish our service with that. If, if Sean and the worship team wants to come on up, uh, we're going to finish by just taking communion and just focusing on on God's grace. You know, the reason why we're able to be so bold in our weakness is because He is strong. And Jesus wants us to focus on his grace. He says, as we gather to make sure we remember this and implement, he implemented communion for us to remember his grace that, that our strength comes from the cross. And, you know, we have a high priest that bore our shame and he was without sin. He knows in his flesh and humanity what we go through and he's interceding and praying for us. Um, and now this great high priest, he sympathizes with us, knows our struggles and loves us. And he offers us righteousness uh, as we turn to him. And so uh, we want to, as a church, just close with partaking in communion together to celebrate that we can still be weak as a church family and know that Jesus is strong. Because Jesus not only died, but three days later, he rose again and he gives us spirit, his spirit and strength to follow after him. So we're going to sing a song and then Paul's going to come up and... Close us out and lead us in communion.